Hi, everyone. My name is Julie. I'm a Children and Youth Services Librarian at Vancouver Island Regional Library, and I'm here to introduce today's special weekly event. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional territories of the Indigenous peoples of each of the communities in our service area and represented by those in attendance at today's virtual program. I'm coming to you today from the unceded territory of the Sunemu people, whose historical relationship with the land continues to this day. Welcome everyone to our special Summer Reading Club weekly virtual event. Our very special guests today are Gary Allen and his wolves. Uh, some of you may have seen Gary and his wolf Tundra at your local library. Uh, they've done presentations at mm, quite a number of our branches in the past. And in fact, Gary has been conducting wolf education sessions with Tundra for the past 13 years, going into many schools, libraries, and community groups. Today, Gary will be speaking about the importance of wolves in the ecosystem, their family structure, their individual traits, and much, much more. Please join me in offering a warm welcome to Gary Allen and his wolves. Okay. Thanks, uh, Julie. Uh, well, it's, uh, it's great to be here. And uh, um, yeah, we're going to, uh, I'll talk a little bit about wolves, but uh, I'm going to make sure you see lots of video of the uh, of the wolves, uh, and uh, that way it'll uh, be a little less uh, boring just listening to me. Um, you know, we're talking about libraries and that, so what we read is really important. And uh, when we think of wolves, um, you know, there's some really cultural differences. So many of us uh, that come from kind of a European background. You know, got raised on three little pigs, uh, little red riding hood, Peter and the wolf. And so we have this view of the wolf as being uh, um, scary and, uh, and, and threatening. Um, but the First Nations people that, uh, that Julie talked about and acknowledged that we're in the unceded traditional territories of a, a number of the uh, uh, First Nations here on Vancouver Island, they... Um, they learned about the wolf in a whole different way. So let me tell you a, a true story. Um, I do a lot of work with First Nations people. So they tell me their legends and their stories. So I'm, I'm gonna tell you a story about uh, two First Nations uh, brothers from the Numgees um, territory, which is uh, Alert Bay. And they were, this time frame is around the 1890s. Uh, so, you know, about 130 years ago. And they were, uh, went over to uh, Knight Inlet area where they uh, operated the trap line and they, uh, and they did their hunting. Now they were uh, trappers of smaller fur bearing animals like, you know, beaver and muskrat and marten and, and that. Um, but when they arrived uh, over there, they found that uh, one of the foot snares they put out, um, a wolf had stepped in it and uh, the wolf was still alive. Uh, so they, they weren't a trapper of wolves, so they, they spoke to the wolf in the Coagula language, and they said to the wolf to turn its head, and they extricated, they, they released the wolf from the foot snare, and it ran off. Um, now, the two brothers uh, stayed out there, um, and a couple more days later, when they were out there working the trap line and hunting, they, uh, they, they saw the wolf pack or the wolf family group, and they noticed that the wolf that they let out of the foot snare was in their um, uh, was back with its family. And what the wolves did was they chased a deer right over to where the two First Nations brothers were, and they were able to shoot it and, and uh, provide meat for their family. So there's a, a really um, interesting story, a true story where the First Nations brothers uh, did a good uh, deed to the to the wolves, uh, to that wolf, and that wolf relayed that to its family group, and then they re reciprocated, or a um, big word there for some of the younger ones, um, they helped out the First Nations brothers by chasing the deer over there. So you can see that there's, uh, you know, quite a difference um, between how the First Nations people saw the wolf as to uh, sometimes how the uh, European uh, people and descendants of European people saw it. Um, so 
the following up on that, uh, wolves are highly intelligent. You could see from that story how intelligent they were. So let me tell you another story uh, to show you how intelligent wolves are. Wolves can do what is called problem solving. Uh, they can take a situation that they've encountered, uh, not encountered before, and they can find a solution to it. And so Mohegan and Nahani were two wolves that, uh, uh, that I had. You're gonna meet uh, Mohegan in a few minutes. When I was uh, raising them and they were about a year old, Mohegan is the female, Nahani was the male. Um, I'd raised them from five weeks of age. And what they were out uh, this one evening, it was in June, as I recall, uh, it was after dinner. They played uh, with this uh, electrical cord and Mohegan somehow, she got this thing wrapped around her neck twice and around her front right leg. And when she went to move, it just got tighter and tighter against her neck. Now, you know, I saw that. Now the, the response from a uh, human would be, oh, well, uh, you just go out there and, and you take this off of her neck. Well, these are not dogs, okay? Um, and if I had have gone out there, even though they knew me well in that, their initial instinct would to be to get away from me, which would have made the problem worse. So Nahani was standing beside his buddy and he saw the predicament that Mahiga was in. Now, Nahani was one of the smartest animals I ever had encountered, and certainly the smartest one that I ever, ever owned. He grabbed the cable and unraveled it twice off of Mohegan's neck and just dropped it on the deck. And end of the story. And, you know, that shows you how, how smart they are. Um, way smarter than dogs. Now, wolves live in, in uh, as I told in that story about the First Nations, they live in a family group called a pack. And in that pack, um, there is um, a real kind of um, hierarchy or a, an order of the dominant wolves, which would be the, uh, the breeding pair, the, the breeding female and breeding male, and then the, the various years of the pups below them and that. So there's a real family sense there. They look after each other so well because it's, it's a tough um, environment for wolves to be out there in the, in the ecosystem that they live in. There's a lot of threats to them. They have to hunt big animals, bring them down. So they got to work as a team, as a family. And, and it's incredible to watch them in that kind of family dynamics. Um, and they really do support each other. And what I found and what I've talked to the First Nations people about is uh, um, when I saw what the wolf family looked like and I said to the First Nations, number of First Nations elders and, and whatever, it seems to me that your family situation is fashioned very much after the wolf, where they cooperatively hunt and cooperatively look after their their offspring and that, and the First Nations people said, yes, that's very true. And that, so there's a real connection there between the wolf and the family um, dynamics they have and the First Nations. And to give you an example of that, Mohegan, when she raised the pups, and you're gonna see uh, uh, shortly um, a video of, of, uh, of these pups, when she was raising them, um, she was so devoted to them and looked after them and cared for them and whatever. And they were so devoted to her and still are, even though they're 15 months of age. And believe me, little wolf pups can be very um, rambunctious and uh, mischievous and uh, they like to play rough and that. And she was so patient with them. And again, uh, when I was talking to a First Nation elder friend of mine, and and that and I asked him if there was any connection there, and he said, you know, um, there is within um, the First Nations uh, grandmothers. They have such a special role within their culture, and so when the grandmothers, and it doesn't have to be your grandmother, it could be a grandmother within the village, if they said uh, to do something, uh, they said it very uh, uh, softly but it was complied with. 
And, and so again, there's that real connection that I saw with how Mahegan treated hers as to, uh, again, the, um, the First Nations uh, with the grandmothers and that. The First Nations people also saw how important the wolf was in the, in the ecosystem. And, and we are starting to see this now, uh, uh, wolf biologists and that. So there's that lovely little video on YouTube called How Wolves Change Rivers. It's only four minutes long. So it's called How Wolves Change Rivers. And you see how um, the wolves being reintrodu reintroduced into Yellowstone National Park in the States, how within a very short period of time, about six years, that they restored that ecosystem because wolves have such a powerful effect upon an ecosystem. They're the ones that control it. And an example I can use is the wolves not only feed themselves, but they feed many, many other animals. So when the wolves bring down an elk that's like 600 to 800 pounds, they will eat first, but they don't eat it all because there's a lot of meat there. And when they're finished eating and they go off to sleep and lay down and that, then many other animals come to feed off of that elk. And one wolf biologist in Banff National Park uh, studied it and, and observed about 37 other species ate off of that elk kill uh, in between the wolves eating first and then the wolves eating again. So you can see that here's, here they are providing so much food for the other animals. I mean, certainly other animals that they will kill, but you know they also benefit from, from the wolves uh, hunting. So it's really, really important to see how, um, how powerful effect that wolves have on an ecosystem and keep it healthy. And that's very important for us going forward. So anyway, um, I'm going to, uh, I think, uh, reverse my camera. Ah, and that, oh, here, I'll show you. Since we're talking about um, the library and books, here's a couple books that I really recommend. Um, this one is called Wolf Island by Celia Godkin. And uh, the Vancouver Island Regional Libraries uh, probably have it uh, and you can uh, get it. It's a very good book. It's a, sort of a grade three to grade five, but um, you know, parents could read it to you. Um, and, uh, and that it uh, talks very well about uh, the importance of wolves in the ecosystem. And here's a book that I wrote uh, called Tundra, A Gift from the Creator. And the Vancouver Island Regional Library has six copies of this book, okay? And it's the story, of, as Julian mentioned, the 13 years that Tundra and I have been going into schools and First Nation communities and that. It, and there's many stories of, of First Nations and the wolf in that and Tundra and I interacting with them. So um, that this one uh, is definitely available in the library because I know they got six copies of it. So anyway, what I'm going to do is we're going to go find Tundra who lives in the house. So you can, I'm just going to show you the floor. I know it's kind of boring, but um, Tundra is 13 years of age. Actually, it's almost, but almost 13 and a half. And uh, 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 I'll come and get her there. Oh, here, come on, Tundra. Here she comes. There she is. Hey, Tundra. Oh, you doing, girl? Hey. So uh, Tundra is a very sweet girl. Yeah, she is. So Tundra has been in, we've been in over 200 schools in BC. We kind of stopped counting. And she's seen over 35,000 students. And this is how she greets them. She just stands there and they pet her. Hey, girl, how you doing? Oh, she's a lovely girl. Yes, you are. Yeah, sure. So she she likes to be in the house. Um, and that, in fact, while it's being hot, she lays in front of a fan that keeps her cool. <laughs> or she can come into this part of come on, into this part of the house. In fact, here, there's her bed with her wolf blanket and her little toy. <laughs> yeah, she's well treated. All right, so let's I'm gonna 
see if I can take her outside. And I got some treats, and we're going to go see some of the wolves out out back. So these are pancakes. We had pancakes this morning, and we always make some extra. So we'll go see if if they want some. Come on, Tundra. So here's here's the deck and this is the enclosure where Mahegan and her two pups are. Actually, um, let's uh, let's get a chance to see the pups first. Uh, so maybe uh, we'll roll those uh, those videos. Uh, so there. There's what you get to see. That's the den that they were born in. I'll show you that in a sec. So there's two of them and they're about 17 days old there. So that's pretty rare footage. You don't get to see wolf pups coming out of their den in the wild because <laughs> the other wolves won't let you stand there and film it. <laughs> so there they, there they are there. Uh, Denali's the male and Stakai is the female. Stakai is short for Stakea, wolf in the Hokaminum language, which is the uh, the language here in the Stenemu people on the uh, Coast Salish people on the east coast of Vancouver Island. And, and then I think there's another one that's coming up. That's what... Uh, 17 day old wolf pups look like. They're blind until about 15 days of age when their eyes open up and they're all, they're blue. And uh, that's when they start to, to hear and to, and to smell and to, and to see. Yep, sure, maybe we can go to the, uh, uh, the next one. So there they are. There's Mehegan, the mom. And there's the pups nursing. And I'm literally four feet away there um, uh, photographing this. That's how uh, trusting Mehegan was of me. We didn't try to interfere in any way. Um, and we just let mom do her motherly duties and that. So, all right. So you get to see that. Tundra, come on out. Tundra. Sal, can you bring her out? Okay, so there we go. We're in the enclosure. And what I gotta do is go find these little critters. <sighs> Megan. Come on, girl. So here's, oh, here she is. Here's the bench. And there's, there's some food from this morning that they haven't eaten. That's chicken and beef And there. And there's the den. Can you see the den? That's where they were born. That's where they were trying to climb out of. And look at who's come to see us. Mahegan, how are you, girl? How are you? Hey, come on. Here we are, Mihik. Mihikan, come on, girl. Where's your pups? Mihik, here. Here you are. Here you are. So she's going to pick that up. Look at that. Okay. She, she's got it in her mouth. And she's going to find one of her pups to feed it to. That's what wolf moms do. So let's see if we can see it. <sighs> so way at the back. You can see them. They go out of, there's one of them there. That's Denali. There he is. 
And there's Mahegan. And she's fed one of them. One of them got it. So let's go see if she'll... <laughs> we got lots here. <laughs> so we'll see if... Uh... So this is pretty rare footage. Um, I had a pretty good idea that Mahegan would do that. That she would go and, and feed the uh, the pups. Mahig, where are you? Come on, girl. Here's some more. Mahegan, come on, girl. Here you are. Here. Here you are. You're gonna go. There she goes again. There she is. And she may eat that one. Come on, girl. There you can see the other two wolves. They're standing on a, a stump. Come on, Mahig. Here you are, girl. Here's another one. Hey, they're good. Is that good? Yeah. So Mahegan's about four feet in front of me right now. Oh. Here, 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 the other one. You go, go give that to one of your pups. He's uh, gonna eat that one myself too. So it's the mum that feeds them. Um, they will take food themselves, uh, um, themselves, but it's generally that Mahegan's given them permission to. to to eat it. Um, there, Mahi, there's another one. We'll go take that to. <laughs> so you can see Denali there. I'll see if I can. So I'm not sure how much it'll zoom in, but we're going to get them a, a lot closer up here. So there's Denali, that's the male. And over there, if you can see above just the logs, so she's sort of hidden in behind uh, some of the vegetation. There she is. Okay. Um, I'm just going to come up here and see if... You can like pancakes. Good girl. Good girl. Tundra. <whistles> Mahig.
So the pups are on the uh, on the log howling. Tundra's inside the house howling, <laughs> and Mahegan's over there. So wolves, wolves do not bark. They only howl or whine. And so howling is the main form of verbal communication. And they will howl to, uh, um, to delineate territory. So they're generally howling to another pack to say, stay out of our territory. And the other pack is sending the same message back to the other wolves, stay out of ours. They will howl to bring the pack together um, and uh, they will howl to protect the pack by letting the pack members know of a, of a threat, like me coming into their enclosure, let's say, and they didn't, uh, let's say they didn't like that, then they would howl to let, Mahegan would let the, the pups know uh, that I'm coming into their enclosure. Um, which they don't do. I'm just using that as an example. Um, there's there's Tundra. Tundra's come out onto the deck. Hi, Tundra. Would you was you howling with them, Tundra? Here, let's see. There she is. There's Tundra. Hi, girl. How you doing? Hey. Yeah. So she doesn't come into the enclosure because her and Mahegan don't get along. It's the the dominant female. Where's Mehegan? There she is. There, I'm bent down. There's Mehegan. Hi, Meheg. Where's the pups? Where are the pups? Oh, they're down there. Where are you? Where'd you get to? Oh, there you are. Hey. So this is what you'll see on the live streaming, uh, which they can tell you about when I stream the activity of them twice a day. I have two big security cameras. You see that one there? And there's another one over there. And I can, that's what we're live streaming off of. So there's, there's the pups. So they don't want to get close to us. They like being far away. They feel safer. <laughs> And that's wolf behavior. And there's mom. Yeah, Amy Heeg. And Tundra, I don't know if Tundra is still there on the deck or not. No, she's gone back in the house. Oh, where'd the pups go? See, you turn your head and, and they disappear real quickly. Hi, Meheek. Hi, Meheek. Meheek in. Yeah, where's where did where did Tundra go? Huh? Where'd your pups go? Meheg? Where's where's Denali and Stakai? She says, I don't know, but they're not here bugging me, so that's good. Me? Oh, it's a good. Mahegan was such a, a great mom. 
and still is. Um, she, she, oh, she looked after them, those pups, fabulously. There's, there's Tundra's back up on the deck. Hey, Tundra. Hey, Mahig. Mahigan. So Mahigan's the word for wolf in the Cree language. So we got some of the two large um, First Nation groups covered in terms of the names. Hey, Mahigan. Yeah. Come on, girl. Come on. Hey. How are you? How are you? Oh, that's a good girl. Hi, Tundra. Amy Heek. There she is. There she is. There she is. Let me petting her. If you can see. <laughs> Oh, she's a good girl. Should we see where the pups are? Let's go find the pups. Where are they? Where are they hiding out? They can go hide real easily. <laughs> so anyway, we'll focus in on on Mahegan and uh, and uh, and Tundra. Hey, Tundra! Oh, Tundra girl, how you doing? All right. Well, you had a pretty good view of uh, of the wolves, and you got to hear them howling, and uh, you got to see tundra quite a bit. There's Mahegan back. Hey, Mahegan. How you doing, girl? How you doing? Come on, come on. Yeah, it's a good girl. It's a good girl. All right, hey, hey, Tundra. Put this little gate here so Tundra doesn't walk down the, the stairs here and then she's, she could wander into the community, which she, she doesn't. She likes being here, don't you? Hey, how are you? How are you, girl? Let's see if I can. There we are. There she is. Hey, Tundra is very social, which is not usual wolf behavior. The wolf behavior of the pups is the usual behavior. They don't want to have any contact with humans. That's why you, you don't see them out in the wild very, very seldom. Hey. All right, Tundra, do you want to come in? So there's Mahegan still wandering back and forth. So let me, all right. So there we, there we are, we're, uh, um, you've got a good chance of, uh, of, uh, of seeing 
all four of them. You got to hear them howl. Uh, we talked a bit about the importance of howling. And uh, in my book, uh, the, the Tundra book, uh, I uh, talk about uh, further the importance of, of the howling that wolves do. Um, you got to see Mahegan feed them. Um, she took one of the pancakes down to the pups um, and then she ate about four or five others herself. Um, but that's what she does. And what happens in the wild is that they will just, you know, the, the moment and that will distribute the, uh, the food to the, uh, to the pups, even, uh, you know, after they've been weaned, uh, weaning is after they've, uh, don't need to be nursed anymore. Um, I don't know, Julie, if you wanted to, and, and if you're able to hop in here and, uh, um, you're certainly welcome to talk back and forth if that's, uh, if that's um, yeah, I'm, I'm still here. And in fact, we have some questions coming in. If you have oh. a to answer them. Yeah. Oh, sure. Have sure. a good time. Sounds good. All right. So we have Angela asking if pancakes are their favorite treat. <laughs> uh, no, actually, uh, the favorite treat is uh, they get um, uh, a chicken jerky. Uh, that they like uh and they also get uh, pieces of wiener uh which i use as a treat which they really like and uh and then i also give them a which they seem to like um one of those um uh teeth uh, you know they chew on it and it kind of cleans their teeth they they like that but uh yeah they will they, they will definitely eat the uh the pancakes but and Typical, you know, they're just like uh, like kids, right? Uh, you know, they want the pancake before they eat the chicken and the beef and that. So, you know, they're no different. <laughs> Excellent. And then we have Jaden, age 11, and Luca, age 9. And they're wondering if the baby's coats will darken as they get older. Ah, uh, good question, uh, Jaden and Luca. Um, and the uh, they're likely um, uh, the coats really start to change from about eight to nine, eight to ten weeks of age to you know, maybe about six months of age. Um, now, Denali, who is the the male, um, his coat's actually getting lighter as he gets uh, uh, older. His dad. The dad was an Arctic, um, and in fact, here let me let me show you let me show you the the dad. Unfortunately, he passed away. There, that's Nohani. He was a, an Arctic, so you can see he's all white, and that, so we didn't really want to breed them, but they determined that they were going to breed. So he's actually getting closer. Denali is getting closer to uh, to his dad's color, uh, and and uh, Stakai is is uh, uh, darker, um, and and she's gotten a little bit darker. Whether she gets any darker, um, it's tough to say, but I I don't think so. I think the coats that they got now are pretty well going to be what it's going to be like going forward. Fantastic! Yeah, such variety. Um, yeah. We've got, we've got Jack and he's age five and yep. he wanted you to know that he has been howling with the wolves. <laughs> oh, good, Jack. <laughs> and that's, uh, uh, yeah, that's, uh, you, you, sometimes what happens when I'm doing it, uh, uh, to, uh, class, you know, kindergarten, grade one and that they like to howl along. So, uh, I hope, uh, Jack, you're practicing your howling and, uh, and it'll be well received by your your family. <laughs> yeah, and I can say I've got two cats here. And when, when the wolves started howling, they went absolutely crazy. I should have locked them in a bedroom or something. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Julie, I'll know for next time. Yeah, that that, that happens with uh, with cats or dogs. Uh, you know, dogs will hear the wolves howling, and then all of a sudden they start howling. And uh, so I've I've had that. Uh, um, uh mentioned to me uh, on a number of occasions uh and that but it's interesting that you know they they can hear it right i mean they hear it through the technology through your you know whatever you're using uh 
a, a tablet or a, or a, um, a smartphone or something, and and they know that it's that it's a wolf. You know, the, there's no there's no uh, mistaking it for them. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, okay, and then we've got Lisa, and she would like to know if you are local. She thinks she recognizes some of the plants. So you're here on the island. Yes, I live in Nanaimo. There we go. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And, oh, Sarah would like to know where is the dad of the pups? Well, as I mentioned, he, he passed away, unfortunately. So, uh, yeah, uh, Mohegan's a, a single parent mom and uh, he's done just an incredible job uh, of, uh, of uh, looking after these, uh, these two pups. Um, uh, you know, in, in the wild, what would happen is uh, if Mohegan was born to a pack in the wild, you know, she would remember her mom looking after her, you know, nursing them and, and looking after them. And then also the other members of the pack, which, uh, you know, participate very much in, uh, in the looking after them. And then yearling wolves, which are one-year-old wolves, part of their uh, main part of their uh, responsibility is, is to look after the pups. So when the older wolves are out hunting, you know, they're, they're puppy sitting and, and they're looking after the, the, the wolves, uh, wolf pups, making sure that they're safe and, uh, and, uh, you know, play with them and that bonding and that, that takes place. And then at two years old, they, they would be doing the same. And at uh, three years old, if they stay within the pack, now, Mahegan didn't give birth to these pups until she was five years of age, uh, which is, you know, quite late. And she had no benefit of that. She, you know, she didn't, we think that she, even though she was taken away from her mom at about 12 days of age, we think that she still recalls that um, because when, um, when the, the pups were born on the 23rd of May in that den. She hung out around that den and, and that bench where I was uh, showed you where some of the food was. And then on June the 1st, uh, I went out there to feed them in the morning and they were gone. They weren't around the den whatsoever. And so, and what she did was she took them down to that pile of logs that you may have seen when I was sort of searching for the pups in that. And there was a whole bunch of uh, kind of tunnels and and uh, dens down there that Nahani and uh, and Mahegan had uh, had uh, dug, and she took them down there, and that's where she raised them, and she made it very clear to myself and to Sally that they're my pups. Uh, you're not going to take them away from me. Not, not that we had any intent of that whatsoever, but she was making it very clear to us. And that's where she raised them. And she would let me go down there to bring them food. But she also let me know where the boundary was. And so if I step beyond that boundary, she come at me. Um, not in a, in a real aggressive uh, way, like teeth showing and snarling or anything like that. She would just run up to me and say, OK, that's far enough, pal. And, and I respected that. I, you know, in no way did I want to. Uh, disrupt her and that so I'd leave the food there and then I'd I'd move back quite a ways and I'd just watch them and uh, she learned you know on her own how to look after them and uh, and so she didn't have the benefit of of all that kind of apprenticeship that she would have had if she was in a uh, out in the wild within a pack so uh, um, yeah it was it was fascinating to watch her uh, look after them yeah yeah, sounds like a really good mom, for sure. Oh, it's fabulous. Incredible. Yeah. yeah. Oh, the questions just keep coming in. This is oh, okay. Yeah. So Tricia would like to know, at what age do you separate the male from the females? Um, from Denali? Actually, we're not. We're not going to separate them. Um, and uh, we, at around two years of age, so in another year, that's when um, wolves become sexually active, okay? So they can have pups at around two years of age. They can't have them before that, they, um, the sexual maturity. 
And, uh, but, you know, we don't think that because they're brother, sister, um, that they will mate. Um, I, I, I'm pretty confident in that, that they don't do that in the wild. And they're, you know, I don't think Stakai is going <laughs> to tolerate in the honey try, or Denali trying to, uh, <laughs> to mate with her. And Denali's not going to mate with his mom. Um, and, uh, and that, so they're going to live out there, um, you know, uh, together and, uh, and as that kind of threesome family for, uh, you know, for, uh, many years. Wonderful. And then we have Ellen age six and live age three. And they want to know, do wolves have good hearing and why are their ears pointed? Okay. Yes, they have very good hearing. Um, they can hear, for example, uh, on the tundra. So way up in Northern Canada where, you know, it's above the tree line. There's, there's no trees. It's just sort of small shrubs on the, on the uh, ground. Uh, they can hear howling uh, 16 kilometers away. Um, and they can hear it when they're in what is called the boreal forest. Um, and that, uh, which is the northern forest where you got the small pine trees and that, they can hear howling about 10 kilometers away. And I suspect they can probably, the same like the time here is, uh, uh, or distance here on Vancouver Island. And uh, their ears, yes, they're pointed. Um, and that notice, and I don't know if you got a chance to, the ears on a wolf are actually smaller than a comparable sized dog. So for example, a German shepherd dog has much larger ears than, um, than, a, than a wolf. Um, and that, so, and let's go back to see um, the honey here. There, he's, notice how small his ears are. Those are fairly small ears. And given that he's an Arctic, the, uh, um, the Arctic wolves have small, the smallest ears, just like the polar bear. You look at a polar bear's ears, they're the biggest bear. They have the smallest ears. The grizzly bear ears are bigger and black bear ears are bigger. And the reason being is it's so darn cold up there. You don't want big ears because they're going to freeze. So they have them smaller. And given that the wolves, even though they're not living up in the Arctic, it still can get, you know, they can get 20, 30, 40 below zero um, <coughs> in the wintertime, uh, particularly interior of, uh, of BC. So you want big ears. Uh, that's a, that's, that's a, a detriment to, to having big ears. Fantastic. So much to learn. And I think that's the end of the questions. I don't see any more coming in at the moment. Okay. So I guess we are about done. But All right. Um, absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much for being here. And for oh, good. the good. wolves. Yeah. So did, yeah you get, so nice. did, so, did you get to see the wolves well enough on the video? I'm sure the people did at home. I, I'm because I'm on the screen too. It's really, really tiny. Oh, okay. Yeah, I could definitely see them when I got very close to the camera. So on a big screen, I'm sure everybody got to see them for sure. Sure. And that's so, uh, yeah. So I, you know, I would encourage you to, you know, uh, go to our website and uh, you can learn more and, and see more of the videos and that. And then uh, if you want to see these uh, um, Mahegan and the two pups, uh, playing around and uh and you see them at nighttime uh so those cameras are night vision so you um i pick them up at right now it's around nine o'clock when it changes from um uh, the regular camera into the night vision so you get to see them at nighttime with their eyes sort of shining at you and that so it's uh, it's really quite uh, quite exciting uh and that i'm sure many of your the children and uh, and parents or whatever would like to like to watch it. Yeah, that sounds absolutely great. So your website is tundraspeaks.com. 
which Correct. right on our Facebook uh, page, right where this uh, live event is happening, so everybody can see it. And then your Facebook page is Gary R. Allen with an A, yep. A L L A N. Correct. Yeah. We'll, Correct. We'll put links, yeah, for people right on right on our Facebook page. And you said yep. the cameras are live from five till eight a.m. and then Correct. to eleven a.m. Um, yeah, for, well, from 8 p.m. to 11 p.m. 8, 8 to 11 p.m., yeah, yeah. So. And, and I'll probably change those hours, you know, come the fall because they'll be more active during the day. Right now, they're, you know, um, I mean, today's a much cooler day than, you know, a few days ago. Um, and I don't see them until 5, 30, 6 o'clock at, at night when they may start to wander around, but they're certainly not active. They're just you know they've they've got up and and that and uh, so there's not much uh, point in doing anything during the daytime because you can't find them <laughs> wonderful well thank you so much for being here gary uh it really was a wonderful presentation really enjoyed it uh, well i'm glad uh and that's my pleasure and you know uh i know certainly uh you know lee uh and and natasha and jason and uh the other staff at the uh uh virginia in uh in um sydney i don't know if she's still there uh and that you know as you mentioned at the beginning we've done a lot of a lot of presentations for uh bank of Ireland regional library and we really appreciate the support that uh, you've given our program so thank you very much no problem no we've enjoyed having you sure. uh and if everybody at home, if you've enjoyed this presentation, if you can just leave a comment for us on our Facebook page, telling us what you enjoyed and how you enjoyed it, uh, that would be wonderful. We'd love to see those. And just a reminder, everybody, that we've got more Summer Reading Club fun still to come. Uh, for the complete list of performers, head to the kids page at birl.bc.ca and follow the link to find out all the fabulous things we have happening for Summer Reading Club including a link to join our Facebook Summer Reading Club program. And then while you're there, you can also like us on Facebook and Instagram, uh, follow us on Twitter, and sign up for our e-newsletter. So thanks again for everybody at home for watching. Uh, we'll see you here again next week. And in fact, next week is a very special week because we don't just have one performer next week or one presentation next week. We actually have two. So we'll be back here at our regular time, Thursday at 2 p.m. with um, author Nadia Hahn, and she'll be reading from one of her books and doing a craft with us. But then also on Friday, so not tomorrow, next Friday at 2 p.m., uh, we'll have authors Jeremy and Hermione Tankard here with us on Facebook talking about their new book, York and Bones. Uh, so it really is going to be an amazing week. So thanks, everybody. And we'll see you again next week. Bye. Bye-bye, Julie.